and thank you for the invitation. It's a real privilege to be here and re reinforce the Happy New Year to uh, Malaysia, Dubai, Edinburgh, Orkney and Gala Shields. Welcome today. I hope you're not uh, steeped in snow in the northern reaches of Scotland for those that are there. Um, so I want to start today's talk, which is in three parts, by just asking the question, uh, why take a program approach? And I'm going to scope some of the problems uh, that have occurred for student learning uh, that can occur through taking a modular approach and how we can overcome them and some ideas to overcome them. I'm then going to look at uh, the implications of modular assessment on assessment design and bring some evidence to this and some practical ideas that you can discuss in the chat. Uh, following that, I'm going to have a section reframing feedback as a dialogue. You may ask why I'm here. Well, I'm here because uh, over the years, over the last 15 years, I've led a project called Transforming the Experience of Students Through Assessment, which is an in-depth uh, look at program assessment, taking a program approach through using evidence and a change process. It's worked in many universities, more than 50 globally, on hundreds of programs. And I know in Scotland, it's had quite a lot of traction. Um, the hunch behind uh, transforming the experience of students through assessment is really that some aspects of modularity are hindering a whole sense of a program view of assessment. And I'm going to explore that with you next up. So why take a program approach? I'm, I want to argue uh, that there's six problems that a program approach can help to address. And the six problems are, first of all, that we've got a modular problem, that some of our curricula and assessment is quite fragmented and fractured and doesn't speak across the walls of what you in, at Heriot what call courses and what a lot of the sector calls modules. So I'm gonna look at that in a little bit more depth. And then I'm gonna say, we argue that we have a curriculum problem. We've got a problem of additive curricula where we keep adding stuff to modules and almost the time boundness and the snappiness and pace of modules means that this overcrowds the curriculum and impairs student learning. The next problem I want to speak to is uh, we have a high speed problem. There's been a lot of literature recently about slow learning and slow pedagogies and thinking about how we slow down assessment in the curriculum. And in COVID, we did this through having you know, longer online pieces to think about how students learn over time iteratively in cycles rather than with one off hasty high paced assessments that are uh, high stakes for them. And a lot of that involves thinking about how we shift from lots of measured assessment to more formative assessment. The fourth problem I'm going to scope is the heavy load uh, problem. A, a while ago, I wrote a paper with a colleague called Struggling and Juggling, and how students in modular degrees are juggling lots of things at the same time, and how that cognitive load can mean they never learn in deep ways. So I'll explore that a bit. I think we've also got an engagement problem, which is a consequence of all of these things. And I'll explore that in a little depth. And finally, you mentioned it, Richard, uh, how we handle generative AI in a context of um, modular degrees is something we need to look at. So we've got a generative AI opportunity and problem that I want to just look at briefly before we move into the more practical session. So six arguments about assessment initially. And my first argument really starts with a picture, which I think sums up our problem with modular degrees. Um, and this is a picture some of you may have seen. Um, it's a picture of an elephant where uh, individual academics, if you imagine them, are looking at their part of the elephant. Indeed, they might be admiring the two tusks, the trunk, the ears, the tail of the elephant. But what's happening here is they're only seeing their bit of the elephant, which represents the whole experience for students, the whole curriculum. And these modular walls mean they've got a tight framing where they may not see 
whatever's going on before and after in the student experience. They may be repeating stuff. They may not be sequencing assessment, challenge, varieties through the program. And they may be over assessing and squeezing out formative opportunities in these time bound boxes. What happens from a student experience is often the feedback is trapped in these units and they dispose of it after each uh, course because they don't see how to carry it forward into the next uh, unit, which feels quite different. And so you have this fractured sense of the entire assessment narrative, which from a student perspective and occasionally even from a staff perspective can look more like this. You get a a fractured picture of the elephant from a, from a student perspective when you design assessment at a modular level, where it doesn't quite stack up and tell a whole assessment story, which leads the student from beginning to end, end in a carefully navigated journey through engineering, philosophy, history, whatever it is. When you uh, collect data from students on TESTA, we have a questionnaire and we do focus groups with students. You get the sense both in the questionnaire data and from students in the focus groups. We also do a program audit with academic staff to look at what assessment looks like across the whole program. I'm going to give you a couple of quotes from students and let you read them about their experience on modular degrees. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll move on to the next slide and you just read them, I think. So you can see from these quotes, there's a sense among students on some programs that this is not a whole story. There's also a sense as though the structuring of assessments doesn't quite stack up and it leads to repetition, duplication, lack of variety of assessments and things not being connected across the whole curriculum. So that's the modular problem. If we move on to the curriculum problem, um, it looks a bit like this that more and more gets added to the curriculum as knowledge expands and explodes. Sorry, it's Tuesday. We have a fire alarm for a few seconds, always on a Tuesday. Forgive that noise. Um, Lee Fink, who writes about curriculum design um, in the States, talks about two ways of seeing curricula. One is content oriented. And if you've got a content orient, oriented curriculum, you stack stack the knowledge high, pilot high, and you test students through memorization. Whereas if you have a learning oriented curriculum, you do what is your duty as a lecturer, which is basically to select what really counts in the curriculum and to let it represent some of the concepts and knowledge that are required and then create space for students to do more learning. So it's about strimming out. The job of us is to think about what is the key foundational knowledge and to strim out the repetition to create more space for students to learn. Modular curricula don't encourage that. I mentioned the high speed problem. So one of the issues with having these bounded courses, sorry, I'd forgotten when I came into the office that Tuesday's um, uh, uh, fire alarm testing. So you've got that in your recording. Is that uh, two Canadian academics wrote this wonderful book called The Slow Professor, which basically says we need to we need to slow the academy down in order to engage ourselves in more reflective thinking, more research, more thinking about our teaching. And we need to slow it down for students so they've got time to do in-depth learning. And you can see here, you know, there's sort of so much material to cover so fast. And the sense of exhaustion we've experienced in higher ed means that actually uh, this is accentuated by the bounds of our modular courses. So that's the high speed problem. I want to talk now to the heavy load problem. And the heavy load problem is uh, like this camel carrying loads of things, uh, that there's 
a lot of over-assessment, a lot of summative assessment, especially driven by continuous assessment where you have lots of little things, which means students are always under stress and we're always marking. And then in relation to the heavy load, we often think varieties of assessment are a great thing, and they are, but when they are randomly sequenced across a whole program, students have to get to grips with, you know, a podcast, a project, a poster, a presentation, an exam, a, an open book exam, different varieties in a way that's cognitively very demanding. So sequencing those varieties across the program is really important. Often the heavy load occurs in exams too, where the synthesis of lots of material, that content, means that they are under huge cognitive pressure and often with several courses stacking up at the end of a, of a exam, stacking up at the end of a course. You'll see I've put formative there. And in this paper, uh, Carmen Thomas, Thomas and I show there's not a terribly heavy load of formative assessment. So there's a sense in which the thing that we know helps students to learn the most, enables them to make mistakes uh, and learn from them is often absent in the modular diet. The final problem, second, the penultimate problem is all of these things add up to a bit of an engagement problem. Because there's so much grading, students get quite transactional. They don't engage in a transformational education. And all they think about is, how do I get a first or a 2-1? I, I bet there are people on this call who've had this question. How do I get a first or a 2-1? They often feel overwhelmed with all the assessments coming together at the same time in a grand pileup. The assessment also feels done to students. You know, there's not a sense in which as Richard said, students want to shape their learning. They want to shape how they use AI, how they research. And when you've got loads and loads of assessments coming together, it feels like you're in a factory where it's done to you rather than a slower journey. I think one of the consequences of modularity and of sometimes people not talking to each other from different modules is that standards start to vary and students don't quite trust that the standards on one course are the same as the standards on another course and that they can use the feedback from one course to inform what assessment on another one. And the whole thing starts to feel unfair when it's not calibrated across a whole program. Finally, on, on modular degrees, you get a sense that students feel this is just a rat race. You know, what difference does this assessment make to me? How is it changing me? And how can I change society with the knowledge that I'm learning and the skills that I've gained? So that's the kind of engagement problem. It's been accentuated through COVID, but it exists because of our assessment diets. One thing about generative AI, I think if we have principled assessment design, we can, uh, and principled teaching, we can make a virtue of generative AI. Uh, I'm not sure at Harriet what, but at Bristol, we've got an open source uh, site for students to make use of and learn how to use generative AI. I bet we don't need to be teaching students how to use generative AI, but we've got a fantastic interactive site um, that enables them to think about how and when to use it and when not to use it, when it actually impairs the building up of intellectual skills. Mm -hmm. um, so, I think the principled ways of doing assessment help us cope with generative AI. The more authentic our assessment, where students can actually do things that are meaningful, that are collaborative, that engage them in public spaces, that they bring their voice and shape to, that they use research for, the less reliance there is on AI. Where we want to use AI potentially is to get them generating and critiquing material that AI creates in a transparent way. The more we use assessment and see it as a process rather than a one-off measurement, the more we can integrate generative AI in our teaching in class and enabling students to see both its value and its downside that actually humans have unique contributions to bring to knowledge generation, that there's bias in AI, that there's faux creativity, that we can do better often with our unique talents and gifts. Um, I think one way of doing this is working in class with formative cycles, 
that's feed into summative assessment. One final thought on academic integrity is just that Phil Dawson, who's really the world's expert on academic integrity, cheating and plagiarism and e-cheating, says the best way to authenticate assessment in a time of uh, generative AI is through program methods of authentication. So across a whole year, across a whole program, saying let's have a viva, let's have one thing that brings together the key elements of courses and says, do we know that this is the person who's done all this assessment? So some ways of rethinking and reimagining uh, program authentication is the way through. So the work of tester and the work of taking a program view is really our fire insurance against generative AI. It's very, very important. Working at a module, sweating the small stuff to look for little bits of um, cheating here and there is not going to cut the mustard. I want to move on now to some practical ideas. I've, I've given you some arguments and now practical ideas. So I want to look at the implications of modular assessment on assessment design, some evidence from students. And again, I'm relying mainly on the qualitative evidence. There is quantitative evidence, but it's more fun to look at what students say. So I'm doing that today. Um, but there's a little bit of quant. So I'm going to talk about the grammar of assessment. Um, and, and I'm going to argue that there is a preposition problem in assessment. And the preposition problem is that um, we do far more assessment of learning, far more assessment to, um, to measure student learning than we do assessment for learning. I just want to ask you, are you seeing on your screen my top bar? Because it might be impairing your vision. Can someone just tell me from the team? No, it's fine. Fine, great, sorry, I'm seeing it and it's disturbing me, sorry. Uh, it's, the, it's the perils of Zoom. Um, so the preposition problem is we've got a lot of assessment of learning, uh, which is measurement and high stakes, and far less assessment for learning, which is formative, enables students to take risks, be playful, have fun, and learn from their mistakes. If you look the, at the ratios across hundreds of programs, it's one formative to five summative. And those are in a number of different countries where we've run tester. So there's a very low formative ratio. Tony Harlan speaks of us having an assessment arms race, where on each course, we add more assessment to get more attention of students to kind of up the ante. And he argues that we need a sort of a nuclear climb down on assessment, where we all agree across a program to have less summative across the whole program and to engage in more formative because summative and formative are competing across different courses in the way that kills the formative on some units, on some courses. He also argues that summative is often used as a pedagogy of control, a way of getting students to do the work. And it's far more engaging once you climb down to enable students to learn the virtues of formative assessment, but it's challenging. We often give verbal assent to formative assessment, which doesn't count towards the degree, where the feedback's really important, and which all students, rather than just the keen ones, should be doing but it's not well practiced and widely practiced. And I wanna give you some ideas today around that. But before I do that, a little bit of data from students. Um, so let me just uh, move on. Here's some data. Students say there's so much summative and so little time. Have a quick read. You can see the impairment of learning, students rushing, students kind of on a treadmill, students also... Oh, I don't think I can stop that. I'm going to go on the treadmill and walk while I listen. Not coming to lectures because of, because of this. So it's impairing students' learning. What do they say about formative?
you can see that where students are doing formative, they're saying, yes, it's great because it's a process. We learn from this process. We can iron out our conceptual misunderstandings along the way without it testing us and giving us the marks. Um, but we know that formative is difficult to do. So this is what students say about why they don't do it. For me, the last comment is really important. We know from all the literature that it's actually the feedback, the recalibrating, peer, tutor, whoever's feedback that really starts to encourage the reflection on how you do things and improve your thinking. So, the, so the, the, the feedback is key here. So I want to move us on to some ideas. And these ideas come from some from Bristol, some from the sector. Uh, and I'm going to ask you, as you look at these ideas, what excites you about it? And if you can put what excites you in the chat, that'd be great. How could you adapt or improve on each idea in your discipline? And what might be the implications of using this idea on your program? The first idea comes from a, a politics course at Bristol run by uh, an academic called Chris Rossdale. Um, and he runs this third year unit called the Politics of Rebellion. And he does quite interesting things to get students doing formative assessment. The first thing he does is he encourages them he gives them really interesting readings and he asks them, requires them to write 300 word weekly written personal responses to the readings. Now, uh, you'll know in politics and international relations and most humanities, most of the time you're writing critical rational pieces about an analysis of a political idea. This is a personal response. And so what he asks students to do is to write creatively to use poems, memory, uh, the links to the meaning in their world. So it's a personal connection. Students are a bit jarred by this initially. Uh, they do 10 of them formatively through the term. It doesn't count. And what Chris does is he integrates these um, blog posts or written pieces come in a few days before seminars. The seminars have about 30 students in them. And he reads them and shapes up the seminars round student um, personal responses. Um, and having done that, he asks students at the end of the uh, semester to submit a portfolio of the best five pieces they've written um, and a reflection on those best five, a synthesis. He then, to return the personal nature of this unit, gives them personalized feedback using audio feedback. How do students find it? We've done tester on this program and what students say is it's the best uh, course on the whole program. It builds relationship, they get to know one another, they get, it builds their engagement, they make a personal connection, they get to grips with the material and they become more confident. Writing really matters and this unit reinscribes the value of students as writers, but also bringing themselves to the writing and shaping their thinking in a slightly different way. So that's politics. Let's move on to biological sciences. And so on this next video, Andy Wakefield, who works in bio biological sciences, will speak about a formative, authentic podcast assessment. Let me just put the captioning on. Hello, I'm Andy Wakefield from the School of Biological Sciences. A few years ago, I took over a unit entitled Conservation Biology. This unit was assessed through a end of year exam worth 60% and the remaining 40% came from an essay that the students wrote as part of their continuous assessment. Now, this essay was fine. It uh, allowed students to have a go at uh, developing their research skills within conservation biology. But actually, I wanted to change it up a little bit and afford students um, greater opportunity to have a go at uh, collaborating with one another, to develop their communication skills, to have a go at listening to each other and potentially having transformative experiences through listening to their peers' opinions, um, to engage in critical debate. I wanted to boost students' uh, digital literacy. 
Um, and I also wanted to, to actually diversify some of the assessment landscape within our school too. As a science subject, uh, we're quite heavy on the written lab reports and the written essays already. So how does this work in practice? Well, students get given a random partner for their first formative podcast task uh, and a topic to work on. They have a go, they have lots of fun, they make loads of mistakes, um, but we give them lots of feedback and then they go off and choose a new partner uh, and choose a new topic from a short list of titles that we give them um, for them to use when creating their slightly longer summative podcast. So what do the students think of it? Well, um, based on a couple of years worth of uh, evaluation, both pre and post pandemic, we know that students really value uh, these podcast tasks. And in fact, they prefer them to traditional essays, um, saying that they're better for building their confidence as communicators. Uh, they find them more fun and more enjoyable to work on, which in turn leads to greater motivation to work on the task itself. Uh, and they also identify that they're quite authentic in nature as well, and actually include some of those skills that they might go on to use after university. Great. Um, let me just move my slides on. So, uh, so that was Andy on um, on biological sciences, and now move on to an MSc uh, module, a unit that. Kate Whitt Whittington runs on stem cell and regeneration. And this is another great formative idea. She's at Bristol. And what she does is she asks her students formatively, so it doesn't count towards the degree, doesn't, doesn't get marks, uh, to complete three short pieces which are relevant to the field and authentic. So they write, and these are short, they're a couple of pages long or a page long. They write a grant proposal, they write an impact analysis and a communication portfolio they undertake. And they sort of templated, uh, they do them briefly, and then they get peer and tutor feedback on each of these. They have discussions, they do this in class. And having done this, having explored what it feels like to write a grant proposal, how to do an impact analysis in skeleton, and a communications portfolio, they decide using their agency um, which one to do as a summative. And that counts 100% towards their assessment. So that's the stem cell and regeneration unit. Uh, formative to summative linked with an element of choice and authenticity in it. A lovely design that might be adaptable. One of my favorite uh, uh, ideas, which can be used formatively or summatively, comes mainly from North America, from Canada, and it's called the two-stage exam. I'm not sure if you've come across it, but on the next slide, I'll show you the two-stage exam. Um, here goes. <laughs> So the two-stage exam is, is a very simple process. You, you do an exam just like normal, an individual exam. The students hand that exam in, and then you immediately get them into groups of four, and you, uh, you have them do the exact same exam again. Once you have your group of four, stay seated. And Sorry. And raise your hands. One of our TAs or instructors will give you a group exam, and then you may start. You want to give them one piece of paper, though. They have to agree on the answers. So they basically teach each other what they got wrong. It's very interesting and exciting to see students arguing about your topic with enthusiasm, and there's high fives and swearing, and it's very, it's very interesting. Oh, no! very happy when they get it right and they're upset when they get it wrong but it's good for them to, to know right away. I think for me the wonderful thing about two stage exams is it's almost like a second chance. There's a first portion where we get to test what we've learned and how we've studied and a second portion where we get to go over some of our answers with classmates so we get different sides of learning. I, I definitely feel like I learn more and I remember more. 
we've done research that shows that student retention is better when, uh, when they do the exams in this format. So they, they correct themselves immediately what they got wrong and then they retain that information better. I, I don't ever want to do an exam another way because it's so exciting and interesting to see students really, really engaging with your material. A colleague of mine in life sciences had a TA that burst into tears when she saw a two-stage exam because they're talking about biology. <laughs> So it's very exciting to see as an instructor. Brilliant. People often ask me about the two-stage exam uh, when I show it in talks is uh, how, they, how the marks get distributed. Um, and, and I think this is a decision that an academic would make, which is, uh, you know, whether you do 70% for the individual bits and 30 for the um, group collaborative element or not, or 50-50 or 40-60, I think that's up to you. What has been shown in all the research on two-stage exams is the, the second collaborative element always gets a slightly higher mark because obviously it's a second chance and you've had time to think about it. And you've also capitalized on the fact that you've got students teaching each other. And, you know, normally if you write a, a, an orthodox exam, you walk out of the exam and those with friends might turn to one another and say, what did you put? You know, how did you, what did you think of that question? Oh, and actually you're bringing that into the learning where everyone has an opportunity to have that conversation and finesse their learning with others in a group. Um, sometimes people find this a, a massive step of courage doing a two-stage exam. How's it gonna work? Uh, and so I encourage people to do it formatively first if they're a bit nervous about it. Uh, when I worked at Solent, they did this um, formatively first. Um, and lecturers came to me and they said they've never seen classes so buzzing. And then gradually they incorporated it into the summative. But instead of doing like a mock exam, which everyone's a bit bored by, you could do this as the mock exam, timetable it, get students to learn for it, and do this formatively as the mock. And it's a brilliant way of students really learning from one another. Final section of my talk is about um, feedback and reframing feedback as a conversation, as a dialogue. I just want to talk about what we find on test day. And again, we're moving to, into the grammar of assessment here. Um, and I'm arguing that we've got a pronoun problem with assessment, with feedback. And the pronoun problem is the emphasis is all on us. I write. I talk, the lecturer does all the work. Students may listen, may read, may ignore. That's the kind of pronoun problem we've got. And it's born of the fact that feedback's constructed as a kind of product, as a, as a monologue, as my expertise loaded onto you, my correction, advice, um, rather than inviting students into a scholarly community where they are making a contribution, shaping their learning. I think what we've got is what Roy Sadler talks about as feedback as telling rather than inviting this, these cycles of reflection where students actually get it and the penny drops. And part of modularity's contribution to this, the modular degree's contribution, is we've often got this kind of one-off feedback, episodic, it's quite short-lived, the walls of the seeing the elephant's tusk or, or tail end at the end of that module and students often dispose of that feedback because they don't see how it feeds forward. And part of this is the fact that we're not seeing feedback as a system, as a process, but as a product that I write, I give, rather than a conversation. What do students say about it? Just one slide on this, have a read. The couple of problems students raising here, are the telling problem, the feeding forward about how I can do better, but also in mass higher education that students feel quite anonymous, that they feel as though um, they get generic feedback cut and paste from our criteria. 
And I think this speaks to a metaphor and a, a changing way of thinking about assessment and feedback. And I, I, I'm suggesting and arguing we need to move away from feedback as a monologue, as telling, to seeing feedback more as a, as a relationship. Sorry, I'm just trying to move my slides and I've lost my mouse, there you go. Um, and I love this picture of feedback as a gift. Ron Barnett spoke about this at a conference I heard him talking at. And basically he says that, you know, when students prepare their assessment for us, they're wrapping up a gift, they're putting a ribbon around it. Uh, when they press the submit button on whatever system we have, they're sending us their gifts. On our end of Blackboard or Moodle or whatever system we have, it's as though we're receiving 100 or 200 gifts at the same time. There may be a whole pile of gray socks and an orange poncho or something, but we're getting all of these gifts together. But for a student, this is quite a precious gift that has spent time to prepare. They've thought about it a lot. They've constructed it. There may be a, a minority who've gone to the late night services to pick up their gift for us, but most of them have sent us their gifts carefully wrapped and prepared. We then get these hundred gifts and it takes us a while to sift through them. And the thank you note takes a while coming through. And when it lands on students, desks it's a judgment and it also um, feels quite cursory quite peremptory um, non-relational as though as that student said they're in a big machine a cipher so I want to make some suggestions about how in some of our assessment on programs we can turn feedback more into a relationship both formatively more into a process and summatively. And I'll give you a couple of ideas. I have a geography lecturer at uh, Bristol who does something called live marking. This is amazing. So it started during COVID. And, you know, basically when you've got hundreds of assessments, you've probably got 15 to 20 minutes to do each one. So instead of her taking the stack away and marking it late into the night, she set up Teams meetings with each student. The Teams meeting, uh, four students who'd written brief technical reports, 500 words or so, brevity is no bad thing. Um, she invites individual students to a 20 minute team school. She doesn't pre-read uh, the assessment. She has some thoughts about how she runs the team call. And basically she marks the word live in a conversation with the student asking questions and clarifying as she goes along. So it's almost like a mini viva and she records that conversation and particularly the last minute of it, she steps away and does a summary for the external examiner. What this does is enable her to ask the question of students, what do you mean in this paragraph? What is that actually, I don't get what you're saying here. And students have to explain themselves a bit like they do in the two stage exam, but it also overcomes academic integrity issues because there's a sense in which I don't get what you're saying enables you to move on. It also helps think, students think about structuring whatever piece they've done and the lecturer to try and help them do topic sentences and move through a piece logically. That's one idea. From Otago University comes another idea. It's an idea from my, I'm a great fan of Tony Harland, which is formative feedback with a rebuttal, which really reinscribes students' agency. So what students do, they write a grant proposal, they write it in pairs, they've got access to examples when they're writing it. Teachers and students both engage in anonymous peer review of these grant proposals. This is formative. And then they have a mock grant panel, which the whole class attends, where they chat about each of the uh, submissions. Having done that, students then write a rebuttal. You know when you get a journal paper back and you get some critical comments and you have a table and you say, yes, I'll accept that one. I understand this is what I've changed or I am changing. And, oh, I'm sticking to my guns on this. I believe this actually adds value. You may not have but I'm not just gonna do what you say. So you take some agency over the piece and they revise and resubmit both the rebuttal and the revision saying why 
they've accepted and rejected comments. And the revision, the summative is marked. So that's another idea to get students really engaged with formative feedback. The final one, I'm sure lots of you do, but giving audio feedback is known to encourage students to feel that the feedback is more personal. It always feels a bit more provisional when it's not hard black text on a script, but a conversation where the dog may bark or the door may open and there are a few ums and ahs and the whole person is there. And I think the tone of it can help students know that this is a relationship and engagement where you as a lecturer really care about their progress. So on that note, I'd love to read you a poem uh, as my finale, um, which really speaks to feedback as a head and a heart thing, as a conversation, and as a personal connection in mass high, higher education, where there is an I-thou relationship in the feedback. The poem comes from How Higher Education Feels, a wonderful compendium of Kathleen Quinlan's po poems from all over the sector. Uh, it's a bit of a, uh, you know, I, I'm not advocating you do this, but it, it does give a sense of the personal engagement that constitutes uh, feedback. The poem is called Weekend Plans. In a talk I recently heard, the speaker said that at 50, a man has less than 1,500 weekends left in his life. Having chewed on this fact for the last week, I now realize that my 1,499th weekend is coming. And so I'm making big plans. On this 1,499th remaining Saturday, I plan to grade a stack of student papers. But knowing that there are only so many of these Saturdays to sit through, I am planning on writing the most remarkable comments and grades I have ever composed. Instead of pointing out where the prose clunks, I will say that the sentence over which I stumble reminds me of a 1962 Fiat convertible I once owned. A car that ran well enough when I bought it until I rear-ended a truck one day and the front end crumbled, pushing the radiator back just enough that the fan chewed a hole through the back end, the blades not only making an unearthly racket, but also bleeding the radiator dry and leaving a green stain on the pavement. And instead of pointing out that a comma is not a coma, that no one and a lot are two words, that a manor is a large country house in a manner of speaking, and that collage is not an institution of higher learning. I will point out to them that Shakespeare too invented new spellings and words, so that rather than see their grades as a kind of condemnation, they might rather embrace these marks as a sort of celebration of their wild and anarchic spirit, which has emancipated itself from all bounds, from all pedestrian prosaic concerns on this glorious remaining 1,499th Saturday. Thank you.